Normally, when we think about DNA, we think about the nucleus of a cell. And that's because a cell's DNA is contained in its nucleus. But there are actually a few exceptions to this general rule. So there are certain organelles that actually have their own DNA. And two very famous examples of this is the, well, are the mitochondria and chloroplasts. So mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own DNA, which I'm just going to scribble in here in blue. And not only do they have their own DNA, but they can actually replicate their DNA and replicate themselves independently of the nucleus of the cell in which they are. So let's just talk briefly about mitochondria. So mitochondria are these organelles found in eukaryotic cells, and they're sometimes referred to as the powerhouse of a cell because they break down glucose to make this high energy molecule called ATP, and then the cell takes this ATP and uses it for all sorts of cellular processes. And the mitochondrial DNA, written like that, mtDNA, has about 37 genes in it. And these genes, most of them have to do with the cellular respiration that's going on in the mitochondria. Let's talk a bit about chloroplasts. So chloroplasts are these organelles that are found in plant cells. They're also found in algae cells. And chloroplasts are the site of photosynthesis. If we wanted to be more specific, so you have these stacks called granum. Well, in singular it's granum, plural it's grana. And those granum are made up of these, that's an M over there. And those granum are made up of these little circles called thylakoids. And photosynthesis happens within these thylakoids. So photo, during photosynthesis, sunlight is harnessed, of course, with a bunch of other steps to make glucose. So this is where the concept of making its own food comes from. It's actually making glucose. It's making its own food. And then that glucose goes to the mitochondria of that cell and gets broken down, make ATP, and then the cell uses that ATP for what, whatever it needs to do. The DNA in chloroplasts, sometimes you're in cpDNA, has about 100 genes. And all, these genes also, most of them have to do with proteins or things that are involved in photosynthesis. And the reason that this is interesting is, well, let's, uh, let's take a look at how sexual reproduction normally takes place. We have an egg cell. And the nucleus of this egg cell has only half the amount of DNA that a normal cell in that organism would have. So we call that N. And then we have a sperm cell. Remember, the sperm cell is really much, much smaller than an egg cell, so this is in no way drawn to scale. And the sperm cell also has in its nucleus only half the amount of DNA that cells in this organism normally have. So that's also N. But then they fuse to make a zygote. And this zygote is 2N. It has the normal amount of DNA that a cell in this organism would have. Half of it comes from the egg cell and half of it comes from the sperm cell. And then this zygote is going to divide into two cells, and then those two cells, of course, divide further. And this goes on and on, <coughs> excuse me, until there are enough cells to put together an organism. But this egg cell, well, it's a fully developed cell, and it not only has um, genetic information, but it has organelles in the cytoplasm. So it has these mitochondria in its cytoplasm, and those mitochondria have DNA in it, which I'm just going to scribble some blue inside. And the zygote also has those mitochondria. Because remember, the zygote is, well, practically an egg cell, but with the only difference being that its nucleus has the additional DNA of the sperm cell. And remember, the sperm cell does not donate anything to the egg cell except for half of the DNA in the nucleus. It does not give the egg cell any, the zygote anything else. So you have a zygote with that those mitochondria and of course they have their DNA in it. And then when this zygote 
replicates itself, so it replicates the nucleus, but it also replicates the mitochondria and the cytoplasm. And these cells will, I'm going to skip out the nucleus, I'm just drawing the mitochondria. So have these mitochondria, but these mitochondria came only from the egg cell. None of those mitochondria came from the sperm cell. And so this brings us to the concept of maternal inheritance. And maternal inheritance, well, it's basically like exactly the way it sounds. It's inheritance that happens only from the maternal line or only from the egg cell. So right here, we're showing that the mitochondria that this organism will eventually have originates from the mitochondria that came only from the egg cell and not from the sperm cell. And therefore, it exhibits a maternal inheritance. So both mitochondria and chloroplasts exhibit maternal inheritance because they are in the egg cell that eventually becomes the organism. And uh, maternal inheritance, it's, it's interesting to note, is contrary to Mendelian genetics. So maternal inheritance is contrary to Mendelian genetics because Mendelian genetics assumes that half of the DNA comes from the egg cell, half from the sperm cell. It does not take into account any sort of genetic information that comes from only one of the gametes, for example, just during the egg cell. And in fact, everything we just described here can be referred to as extra nuclear inheritance. So extra nuclear inheritance would refer to any genes that are passed on from structures that are not in the nucleus. So extra nuclear meaning outside of the nucleus. So mitochondria and chloroplasts are outside of the nucleus. So they, when they are inherited, we refer to it as extranuclear inheritance. So now that we, we've introduced extranuclear inheritance, let's actually take a look at one of the early experiments that helped to discover extranuclear inheritance.